The first panel is uh, uh, dedicated to, uh, will focus on the understanding of migrants' vulnerability, concepts, drivers, protection frameworks, and gaps. So the, the topic is huge and ambitious. It is, however, well chosen given the crucial need to better understand vulnerabilities of migrants. We will have, uh, uh, during this panel, discussions about uh, the notion itself and uh, driver, drivers and so on. Maybe let's start with uh, uh, the working definition provided by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, uh, in uh, a report published last January. This can be uh, an interesting uh, starting point. This, uh, uh, a document identifies several factors. Uh, among them, there are three key factors. Uh, the first one, uh, a vulnerable situation can arise from the reasons for leaving a country, because of course this is always a mix of uh, motivations and uh, context, including uh, uh, not only uh, uh, persecution, uh, uh, but also uh, poverty, discrimination, natural disaster, and so on. Second, the vulnerable situation may occur in the context of the circumstances encountered by migrants during, uh, during their uh, uh, travel uh, en route, at borders, and at receptions. And here, probably, the responsibility of states is crucial to uh, uh, make sure that this uh, vulnerable situation uh, no longer happen. And third, a vulnerable situation is also related, of course, to specific aspects of the person's identity or circumstances, such as age, gender, ethnicity, religion, and so on. So these three uh, factors uh, are, uh, uh, provides a, a better understanding of the notion of vulnerability in migration context, but of course there are many things to develop, to discuss, and I'm very pleased to give, uh, 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 to start the, the, the discussion with uh, 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 Annette, Nanette Thomas, with the Minister of Political and Public Affairs of Sierra Le Leone, and last year uh, she was awarded the title of Honorary Mother of the Year by the activists on Point Sierra Leone Broadcasting Corporation. I'm very pleased to uh, have you here and to uh, know more about uh, your presentation. Members of the Froth Estate, I bring you greetings from the President of Sierra Leone, Dr. Ernest Bai Karoma, and the government and people of my beloved country, Sierra Leone. My president wishes this conference success in its two days deliberations on how nation states and international organizations could manage the challenges that confront migrants and migration. Mr. Chairman, as we are all aware, international migrants in the world has more than doubled from an estimated 75 million in 1960 to more than 232 million, representing 3.1% of the world population. About 50 million Africans are living outside their home country, and 48% of all international migrants are women. And these figures indicate how crucial the management of international migration is, especially in view of globalization, demographic shifts, income inequalities, and climate change, that encourage movement of people across borders for employment and security. Thus, essentially, the scale of international migration has substantially increased in recent years and become a truly global phenomenon. Mr. Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in many cases, many migrants are well integrated into the economy and society of the country of destination. However, increasingly those working in the informal sector and those in an irregular situation are often among the most, most vulnerable. A human rights approach to global migration governance is therefore needed to ensure the protection of human rights of all migrants and their families. Mr. Chairman, it is a fact 
that most migrants do not enjoy any economic, social, and cultural rights, although these values are crucial to their stay in their new countries of settlement. Migrants are oftentimes confronted with severe discrimination in housing, education, health, work, or social security. The laws of their new countries often discriminate against them as non-nationals. As a result, migrants oftentimes do not benefit from programs and policies that should address their specific needs and vulnerabilities. In these circumstances, migrants and their families are unable to access, to access basic services or only being able to do so at levels that do not meet international human rights standards. For migrants in an irregular situation, their vulnerability is compounded because access to remedies is often un un unavailable because of their status. Mr. Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I was a migrant myself. I had to flee my country after I was put in jail by the Sierra Leone People's Party government and charged with treason. Once one is charged with treason in my country, the punishment is death. I suffered a lot of humiliation and was discriminated against as a new common refugee in the United States. I can still hear the voices asking, where are you from? You have an accent. I cleaned bathrooms, scrubbed pumps, worked as a maid, all in the name of survival. I cried for myself, I cried for my children, and I cried for the number of years I worked hard to make myself a made person in my country. Therefore, my advice to all migrants is this. Do not allow anyone to intimidate you. However, for you to be able to stand on your feet and speak, as I'm doing today with authority, you should go to school, and educate yourselves, because education is the only instrument that will take you to upward mobility. There was a point in time, Mr. Chairman, when I was searching for a job. I went through all the interviews and finally had to be interviewed by the president of the company. I was convinced that the job was mine, and when I got home, my answering machine was beeping. I was excited only for the human resource manager to tell me she wanted to hire me, but the president of the company said that I had an accent. Mr. Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the president was very lucky because I was very new in the United States and I just received my employment authorization card to start work. If it was five years down the road, I would have been a millionaire by now because I would have sued the company for discrimination. <laughs> Moreover, effects of global financial crises that affect European countries also exposes mi migrants to racist sentiments and discriminatory practice against their settlement, and this includes documented migrants as well as those in an irregular situation. In these circumstances, the migrants in irregular situation are the first to lose their jobs not only because their status is called into question, but also because they are employed in sectors that are particularly affected by the crisis. Growing unemployment and shrinking state resources make cutbacks in public spending on health, education, and social protection more likely. These cutbacks may occur at the expense of or have a this proportionate impact upon migrant workers and their families. The huge movement of migrants in recent times, particularly from Africa, attempting to cross into Europe, and the many vulnerability challenges they have encountered has moved migration issues to the top of policy agenda in African countries, as much as of the countries of their destination. Governments at both ends of the migration spectrum are increasing their regulatory capacities to manage particularly the large flow of migrants in irregular situations. It is therefore justifiable and appropriate to hold this international dialogue on migration and to discuss solution-based approaches 
towards a global impact that reduces vulnerabilities and empower migrants. Mr. Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, arguing from the African migration perspective, many of the African nationals that embark on irregular migration to the Western world are largely ignorant of the magnitude of migration challenges or vulnerabilities that confront their migration. For many of these jobless, poor, and unsophisticated Africans, their dreams are only of a heaven once they have crossed the Azazod Ocean. They only realize the stark re realities of their adventures when they finally face vulnerability challenges at the point of destination. In light of all of the above, I am to humbly request that all of us gathered here for this two days dialogue forum to seriously consider the issues and attempt to answer the questions raised in the agenda with a view to coming up with solutions that will not only reduce the vulnerabilities, but more so those solutions that empower the migrants. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, like all of you, I'm very much aware that migration issues are very complex issues that require multilateral consensus to arriving at any workable solution to dealing with the many challenges relating to this management. I am, however, equally sure that with determination and commitment, we can achieve at coming up with a solution-based approach towards a global compact that reduces vulnerabilities of migrants across countries and continents. Thank you so much for your attention. Director General of IOM, uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, it's always good to be back. Uh, I'm told that I have to uh, finish my thoughts sharing with you in six minutes. I thought it would be a little longer, so naturally I have decided to drop something and that will uh, give an impression this fellow is totally inconsistent. Uh, please, uh, please bear that uh, with me. Uh, <clears throat> this session uh, uh, expected to focus on understanding of the concept of vulnerability, it drivers, and what that's not there in terms of protecting this particular group of people while they are on the move. Uh, the couple of uh, assumptions that I need to make before I go into vulnerability aspect of mobility. But before that, let me uh, congratulate and thank Director General and the, my dear colleague from ICP for taking up this particular concept linking with the mobility of the people. We have shied away from bringing in vulnerability concept into the world of mobility for some time. And I think this is the first ever discussion on that. And I'm extremely happy because this will feature out quite prominently um, in the uh, uh, negotiation that will take place next year in the uh, GCM. And that I, I will come back to share with me on, uh, on that aspect. Now, migration is an individual endeavor that we have to be very clear. It is not something group, it is not something state, it's not something business, it is an individual endeavor driven by individual need, aspirations, security concern, and the rest of it. So how do we, you bring in the concept of vulnerability into this? So that's what the challenge lies. Now, if you leave that behind and, and, and broaden the idea of individual mobility with the issue of individual doesn't move just by dint of a desire early in the morning of one fine day that I, I will leave my country and go somewhere else. It happens due to the politics, due to the geopolitics, due to conflict, due to a lot many issues. So that's a complex scenario. We, if you leave that behind and come back and think of vulnerability, what is vulnerability? Vulnerability refers to inability to react, to address something adverse which comes out of an adverse environment. So as an individual, you cannot protect yourself. And in the absence of the sense of protection, you flee away the situation. That's what links protection with vulnerability. And it's a complex interface. Now, how do then you create a framework under which this particular mobility 
or movement aspect of human being would be protected. Uh, the Director General has uh, sort of uh, clarified in the opening session that we're talking about people or migrants in a vulnerable situation, not the other way around. Migrants can also create vulnerability by dint of their unorganized, unfriendly movement. So I, I hope the ICP would be able to clarify that are we taking both aspects that here is a group of people or an individual who ends up in a, in a, in a vulnerable situation. That's one. But they can also, by their uh, unauthorized mobility, could create vulnerability. So there's two aspects that we need to look at. And how this will create a framework which will protect them. Absolutely, there'll be different framework for protecting these two different kinds of people because their origin is different, their nature is different, their drivers are different. Now, what is vulnerability in terms of functions? It's a function of a human being. There are three reasons which creates vulnerability or functions of vulnerability. First is resistance. Second is resilience. The third is susceptibility. These three have to be brought in when we are trying to link migration with vulnerability. And I'll just, one, uh, uh, one minute I'll just explain it because otherwise we'll not know where from the protection mandate, where from the protection framework will emerge. First is the vulnerability is a function of resistance. When you cannot, an individual, a group cannot, or do not have the capacity and ability and resources to address a vulnerable situation, a attack, a desperate situation. Second, resilience. You don't have the ability, inherent ability, to face these kinds of situations. There are societies which often faces these kinds of situations, continue to remain in that place. They don't move. So why a particular society moves and others do not move? So what kind of a protection framework that you are talking about? And the susceptibility, the, the physical state of economy, society, the governance, that's the bigger picture. So this is what uh, is migration. I'll not uh, focus much on the, on, on the other thing. Uh, there's a very good definition uh, that I sort of came across while I was doing a little bit of research. Is what is the migrant's vulnerability? What is the peculiarity that we need to point out? And one of the former special reporter on human rights of migrants said, and I quote, the vulnerability of migrants is understood as a heterogeneously imposed condition of powerlessness. That's very important and very uh, determining factor in dealing with mobility and uh, migration and vulnerability. So here it comes. If a group of people or individual do not have the power to determine what the others was talking about, agency and the rest of it, he or she would undertake an unorderly, irregular migration, which we're trying to stop and bring in a new compact, which I'll come back later. Uh, this thing has been in the discussion. Uh, first time it came out, the whole issue of vulnerability, not only for migrants. What, what are the vulnerable group of people that we have? And in categorizing this, and uh, in the negotiation up to that, in Rio Plus 20 outcome document, it has clearly mentioned migrants as a vulnerable uh, um, group. So I don't know how I want to distinguish the two and bring in a, uh, in a new kind of a, a framework. Uh, as I said that, uh, I, will have, I, I think I've already crossed uh, seven minutes. We did a study. Uh, I had a in my previous incarnation, um, I used to work for IOM. So uh, I, uh, we did a study in Bangladesh that why, uh, why some people move and others do not. What that makes people move and move in a risky situation, move in a vulnerable situation. And while doing the study for 18 months, we realized that it's very difficult to identify why people becomes vulnerable through their decision of moving out of their home. 
either within the country and across the country. And while trying to frame this particular phenomena, uh, and in the absence of a consensus globally, we adopted, instead of vulnerability concept, we adopted a concept called harm. That when individual, due to their movement, desperate movement, creates a situation where they are no longer safe, it's called harm situation. And how do you identify harm situation? When people do not have power to decide as to which, who, what he or she will do. No control on, its, on his or her ability to save. So if you pay, take that framework, then it comes as to what you do in terms of protecting them. It's a, it's a very difficult and, uh, 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 and question because it challenges fundamental right of state uh, to, uh, to do, do things which he wants to do. In fact, if you want to create a safe, orderly uh, situation for all migrants, it will come straightway into the conflict of state sovereign rights. So that's where the negotiation would help be held. In the last session, I will share with you my own thoughts as to how, in the global compact, Bangladesh proposed as to what they need to do in terms of protecting vulnerable community, but at the same time, creating a space for state to have the sense of sovereignty. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your invitation, because Italy is the country where a lot of vulnerable people is arriving. Italy is suffering now, but is doing its job, and they will continue to do his job. The arrival of over a million refugees in Europe uh, during last year definitely undetermined those certainties that the old continent had been trying to build a common identity on the last 50 years. The urgent need to solve a problem whose uh, complexity had been underestimated for too long induced the 28 uh, Union member states, now 27, to take very different stands sometimes opposite to each other. So we are faced with completely different choices. On the other side, uh, some countries opening its door to the refugees. On other, some countries are building walls inside and outside Europe to keep migrants out. In these months, various democratic countries belonging to the European Union have taken up position and attitudes that uh, are, to say the least, absurd, and that have saved uh, no one. On the other hand, Italy, in this difficult European context, uh, refound its welcoming self, able to redesign a new role as a country of immigration. Over a 36-month period, it had gone from Europe's talent to almost virtues, contributing in a decisive way to challenge posed by modern migration. After a reception guaranteed for about 200,000 people ending in Italy last year, we were about to close these years with numbers that are higher than those of the previous years. So we can say the reception with a thousand difficulties is now guaranteed for everyone. And that, from an immigration point of view, we are working to take uh, steps forward despite being well aware that the road is still very, very long. An agenda where the inspiring principle is what the Constitution treaties are based on, solidarity. This was supposed to become an equal redistribution of migrants reaching Europe, in particular from Greece and Italy, amongst EU countries. In this way, the Dublin Treaty would de facto have been overcome, enabling better management of flows arriving. This has still not happened if you consider the really low number of replacements in Europe one year after came into force. In so much confusion and uncertainty, the price is being paid by migrants. As we are currently reminded both by protection association, they are not guaranteed the possibility to adjust application for asylum, creating what someone called the state illegality factory, producing hundreds of new ghosts people risking repatriation or being detained in the CIE, Center of Identification and Expulsion in Italy, or in the best of cases, stay in the hellish limbo where they are exploited and blackmailable. We meet a lot of them all over the country. They are disoriented and turn into the humanitarian organization to ask for support or just orientation. 
This situation risks returning our country to becoming the sentinel of Europe, called on to control borders of a continent reluctant to the idea of what is now inevitable mobility, a dangerous idea. Uh, something else uh, that has worried us, especially in recent months, is the exponential increase in refusals, about 60% more, uh, pronounced by the Territorial Commission competent for application to be international or humanitarian protection, asylum or subsidiary protection, and the resulting rise in the tension level in reception center, where immigrants are waiting for a, a, decision, a decision on their status. We are well aware that, though it provided an immediate answer to a need, the quality of that answer was not always satisfactory. The use of hotels and other hospitality structures for tourists proposes therefore different to those foreseen to host international protection applicants, has gone from being extraordinary to being ordinary, so much so that the extraordinary structures covers about 80% of the reception place available in Italy uh, today. We want to give continuity to protection in progress and make reception activities stable while forcing not only the specific request that, from a financial point of view, resource covering at least 7% of the overall cost in the item integration expense be uh, allocated. There is a specific significant acknowledgement of how important it is to invest in integration of beneficiaries. In this framework, where we can exert into a commitment to change, above all culturally, over the reception and protection of those applying for the international protection, we must not forget the importance of the work done by a part of those who materially support the reception system in Italy, the third sector, which, collaborating with municipalities, institutions and local authorities, has been guaranteed since sustainability for years now. And the extremely precarious situation affecting Unaccompanied, unaccompanied foreign minors for whom we don't seem able to set up a system providing instant response causes considerably uh, worry. Investing in reception and integration means not only giving a person back dignity and future, but at the same time producing legality and contrasting all the multiple forms of exploitation we come at against. Then again, that we should be aiming for a structured, coordinated reception system is clear from the fact that a person left to his or her own devices is easy prey for criminals which often use asylum channels to propagate their business. This happened and still happens for the victim of sex trafficking and it's also happening with job exploitation where at least half the workers exploited have an humanitarian or even subsidiary protection permit. This is a dramatic fact that must make us reflect and take uh, action. Lastly, we must not forget that the more integration is implemented involving everyone, the more positive an effect it can have in reducing widespread xenophobic deviation. In our opinion, the positive provision through a Ministry of the Interior interior circular of voluntary work that can be proposed to those benefiting from reception also goes in this direction. It is a way to accelerate integration. The person can be involved in the dynamic of the society he she lives in, interacting, learning and also positively contributing to the well-being of the community of reference where he she will be accepted and appreciated more easily <coughs> and serenely. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you, uh, Director General Swing, uh, and, uh, and other panelists. Um, so I'm going to speak from the perspective of a country, and uh, not a country in the kind of crisis that, that Italy currently faces. Um, and uh, um, I hope that some of what I say may stimulate different thoughts and some debate um, coming from this particular perspective. Having said that, I'm going to focus on two themes which have been mentioned several times this morning already. Um, so that's a good thing, uh, I suppose, um, if there is some consensus around these things already. Uh, one is implementation and the second is integration. In relation to our understanding of what lies behind a migrant being vulnerable and where there may or may not be gaps in our response. 
So my premise is that what we need to do to understand this topic overall, in other words, the kind of vulnerabilities that might occur, how we identify those vulnerabilities when they do occur, and then how we address them, is better implementation of the fundamental rights and protections that apply to all people, including migrants. Now, if we can't um, deliver on these to our own people, then we haven't got a chance of delivering on, on them to migrants as well. So I think we need to look at this, this holistically. And underlying better implementation of our existing commitments is a often effective integration. I'm going to define that very, very broadly. So we need to integrate fundamental rights into our national legislation. We need to implement, we need to integrate elements of that legislation into the guidelines which we use for local authorities and other service providers to address specific concerns towards migrants. We need to integrate service providers, local government and national government, take a whole of government approach uh, and civil society integrated into that as well. And of course, most importantly, we need to integrate migrants with their host countries. I think, as has also been mentioned this morning as well, it's important that looking at this subject, that we remember that the vast majority of people who migrate do so regularly, getting them a legal status in the country of destination and also in the countries of transit where they can also be vulnerable. That's not to say that moving irregularly or finding yourself in a situation which is particularly vulnerable due to a fragile state or insecurity doesn't also require specific attention. But the majority of people who are migrate and so the vulnerabilities that they may face are doing so within a legal framework. So, implementation. We need to live up to our existing commitments, to our own citizens and to migrants, as I said. So states need to have legislation and guidelines in place which cover both citizens and migrants, settled or on the move. There are multiple existing legal frameworks, but more comprehensive implementation is needed. In the UK context, what we want to look at is vulnerability first before defining somebody's migration status. In terms of fundamental rights, it's the individual we need to look at. And we continue to put laws in place that enable us to deliver this. So, for example, our Equality Act, Child Protection Act, Modern Slavery Act, Hate Crime Action Plan all enshrined fundamental rights into law, and migrants have and receive protection under these acts. The Modern Slavery Act is a very good example because it often applies to migrants, but not exclusively so. And the Act has given authorities the tools they need to provide enhanced support for the protection of victims. We only need to tailor the approaches that sit under this in order to develop guidelines which take into account the circumstances of migrants. There are things which is such as basic as, as language and culture and how you identify people, as well as consideration of occasions when migrants might be particularly vulnerable and when opportunities arise to intervene to protect them. This could stretch from your way your agricultural ministry, when it's inspecting farms, may identify that there are people, agriculture being an area where you often have migrant labour, who may be vulnerable to exploitation. Do the people inspecting the farms know how to identify them? Of course, the clearest example is probably at the border. Our border force are trained to screen for vulnerable children and potential victims of trafficking. Vulnerable children, of course, may include our own nationals as well. Under our national referral mechanism, officials at the border, along with other designated first responders, police authorities, NGOs, civil society, refer suspect cases of people trafficking to the National Crime Agency or take on further investigation. Meanwhile, that person or that group of individuals um, has support and protection from the state. And we need to make these guidelines really simple. These, you can't read them, but you can see the size of the card, and I can read them. Uh, <laughs> Um, are the guidelines for, other for our border force at the border. These are the things they need to look out for, the signals. This is their training on a little USB stick, online training which helps them identify and develop. And this, of course, is training which we can share with other people as well. It needs to be simple for service providers so they can identify how it is they implement those frameworks overall. As well as looking after um, what we should be doing with our own countries, we do believe that there's a responsibility to support other countries in meeting their obligations and international commitments. And that can be through technical support, through capacity building, and through sharing best practice. So we work with very many countries. For example, we work in Ethiopia with the ILO to help create legal migration frameworks with the Gulf. Our work in freedom program tackles human trafficking and modern slavery in domestic and garment workers in South Asia and the Middle East. In Bangladesh, we work with the government and with the uh, large NGO BRAC to help migrant workers understand their rights before they travel. 
and we'll also work with countries to help develop and share our experience of how to, to write legislation which can be enacted in practice. Women and girls are particularly vulnerable and a very high priority for us as they are for many other people. Through our Women and Girls Protection Fund, we've reached 200,000 women at risk in the last 18 months across Sudan, Libya, Italy, Greece and the Balkans. The programme provides safe shelter, information and financial assistance, as well as helping to strengthen national counter-trafficking mechanisms. Most of these things we're talking about, I've talked about so far, are to do with covering legal paths and normal times. But migrants can be particularly vulnerable in times of crisis. And so developing and implementing frameworks like the MICIT guidelines, Migrants in Cri Countries in Crisis Initiative, will help us respond internationally to that. Integration. So this is essential as a means to, provide, to prevent vulnerability in the first place and as a means to effectively respond to it. In the UK, we are working towards achieving more integrated communities and creating the conditions for everyone to live and work successfully alongside each other. And this also helps achieve equal access to rights. And tomorrow's morning's panel, you will hear from one of our local councillors in Bristol, who um, I hope will be able to talk about this and shed some, some light on what it's like uh, closer to the coalface. Integration requires the creation of an environment that encourages participation in local communities. And this week, I was even reading in the very, very challenging situation in Libya, um, recommendations which are being implemented about how people from detention centers can be released into work. And that, even if it's temporary, is beginnings of an integration into the economy, which then may put them in a situation whereby they are a bit more self-sustaining and maybe then be able to be returned, as our colleague from Libya was asking us to support earlier, back to the countries from which they came. In the UK, actually, in many countries, the ability to speak English is a key enabler for participation. The Department of Education in the UK integrates English language training as part of its overall uh, global um, adult literacy program to make sure that it reaches people, enables all people, British citizens and migrants, to engage effectively in our societies. So it's important that people that interact with migrants are aware of these services and able to address them so that they can address the vulnerabilities of the people that they're dealing with. In each UK region, we have a strategic migration partnership that provides coordination and support services to those organisations working with migrants. Our commitment to addressing vulnerability is also signalled by the fact that our interior ministry, the Home Office, has a minister whose specific purpose is tackling vulnerability and safeguarding. So in conclusion, I've kind of diverged a little bit from, from, the, from the title, so I'll return. With regard to the concept and the associated drivers, there are, there are undoubtedly migrants who are vulnerable, and that seems to be a, a given. But the fundamental nature of the vulnerability aligns with the vulnerabilities that can be faced by all people, including our own citizens, and we have a responsibility to respond to those. That's not to say that the circumstances of those migrants might not either magnify the risk, for example, those who find themselves in fragile states, or simply just in foreign systems that don't know how to navigate. Uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, Minister Thomas would be a millionaire if she... <laughs> I wish she may or may not be sitting here still, if she was able to navigate the US system better exactly. when she was first At that there. Time. <laughs> um, uh, there are uh, particular vulnerabilities associated also with human trafficking that often pertain to migrants. Though I'd point out that those can also um, pertain to our own nationals uh, within our country, so it can be vulnerable to labour exploitation uh, and trafficking. The protection of frameworks do exist. We don't need new norms, but we do need to work together to implement our commitments more effectively and develop guidelines that address migrants at national and local levels and have an integrated approach across government and civil service providers. And finally, integration of migrants with host communities will reduce vulnerability and enhance access to protection for those who are at risk. Managed legal migration will provide the best opportunities for integration interventions to be effective, as people who may need our support are visible and engaged with our systems. Thank you very much. I hope we have a good discussion of this today and tomorrow. I wish to thank the IOM for this kind of invitation for me to contribute to the international dialogue. And considering the vast number of issues that point and elaborate on the vulnerabilities of migrants in different contexts, this panel is very timely. It brings us to the forefront of the very reason we are, why we are here. 
the well-being of the migrants and the societies they belong to. It is my privilege to be on this panel with my distinguished panelists coming from different parts of the world and to hear their perspectives. I, these states' perspectives that have been shared resonate with me. I am a former migrant, having lived in seven, for 17 years here in this beautiful country. Oh. I was a member of a very active migrant rights um, advocacy movement, and I was very happy to see a few of them here. Well, they're mostly at the back because we were NGOs and continuing to fight and struggle for migrant rights. And I taught international migration law for a long time, and some of those materials were IOM materials. So my engagement with IOM continues in this regard. But what brings us together is our aspiration as to how best to improve and enhance the protection of migrants. In doing so, let me remind ourselves that vulnerabilities of migrants do not come from a vacuum. And addressing this phenomenon necessitates that we focus on the actual needs of migrants as persons, in other words, their dignity and rights. So let's go back a few steps to the countries of origin, where migrants, well, former migrants like me come from, and many of the migrants around the world come from. In the case of one very specific group of people in the context of migration, internally displaced persons, or IDPs, Vulnerability is actually a running theme. IDPs, by reasons of their forced displacement, are bereft of the useful security that is normal in their daily lives. Forced displacement, by its very terms, is not a choice, it is a necessity. IDPs lose their homes, their implements, their livelihoods, their daily family and social ritual, and in their search for safety and security, IDPs may be for, are forced to seek refuge either in their countries or even abroad, which makes them you know, former IDPs. And regardless of the cause of displacement, be it armed conflict, generalized violence, human rights violations, natural hazards, etc., the vulnerabilities are there. In the case of IDPs, as they are IDPs, of course, they remain within the borders of their countries. And as we all know, they may feel later on obliged to leave their own countries and seek refuge elsewhere. Many of these migrants, the migrants that we have now, are former IDPs. And um, they could have been, and they bring themselves their vulnerability, the vulnerabilities that they have acquired while they were IDPs in their own countries. In this quote-unquote migration path, there is the sense of the reality of the loss and the insecurity that underline their vulnerability as IDPs. The substance and level of that vulnerability is subject to many variables, such as age, groups, disabilities, ethnicity, and the like. Children, for example, are an absolutely more vulnerable group compared to the rest of the IDP population. At this point, it must be pointed out that situations of vulnerability of IDPs are usually the result of the failure to prevent forced displacement or the conditions thereof. Vulnerabilities of the IDPs themselves may be traced to violations of obligations under human rights law or civilian protection guarantees provided by international humanitarian law, including by non-state actors. The whole stretch of migrant vulnerability from the moment of forced displacement to the displacement situation itself and to the search for durable solutions is long and tedious. Whether or not IDPs later on decide or are forced to join international migration or seek asylum abroad is besides the point. IDPs leave out this situation of vulnerability day in and day out until the time that they can claim subjectively and objectively their security back within the context of a normal life, be it at home, or abroad. In fact, the UN Guiding Principles on Internal Displacement, promulgated by the United Nations in 1998, is a case book of norms to respond to those vulnerabilities based on state obligations. Based on human rights law and international human, humanitarian law were applicable in armed conflict, the UN Guiding Principles is the first stop for the protection of people forcibly displaced in their own countries, even before they seek abroad. It must also be emphasized that even though the guiding principles are considered soft law, nevertheless, the principles are, in fact, 
Jews Kogans, and in many cases, state obligations acquired under the state's own treaty law obligations. These guiding principles therefore remain a very useful and most ne mostly necessary set of norms that are the basis of addressing IDP vulnerability. States remain the primary entity to have this responsibility. And moreover, the notion of sovereignty certainly enhances that responsibility and cannot be used to avoid it. In addressing the vulnerability of migrants and, and IDPs, the question that needs to be asked, therefore, is where states' IDPs are concerned, how are ID states, how are states able to implement the principles in those guiding principles? This is the imperative for the protection of IDPs. This is the challenge for the primary duty bearer, the states, in order to address these vulnerabilities. At the international level, I wish to emphasize that it would be the duty of the international community of, of states and international and multilateral agencies in addressing the IDP situation to encourage the creation of enabling conditions for the application of the guiding principles on internal displacement. It is essential that global policy discussions include the protection of IDPs as crucial to addressing the overall vulnerability of migrant populations through the implementation of the principles. It was my pleasure to listen to Ambassador Swing, as usual, at the opening of this dialogue, especially when you eschewed the characterization of migrants as victims. This emphasizes the fact that people on the move, including IDPs within their countries, are deserving to be treated as people with political agency and human rights, rather than as victims mere beneficiaries or objects of assistance. Unfortunately, the latter type of mindset has set back the conditions for IDPs to participate in decisions that affect, and to, that affect them and to, engage, to be engaged as partners with stakeholders, especially with their own governments, ensuring the participation of IDPs in processes for their protection and durable solutions will not only make those solutions more sustainable. In addition, IDP participation, genuine, transparent, and accountable participation will provide a clear basis to reduce and overcome their vulnerab vulnerabilities so that they can can live in safety, dignity, and rights, and if they wish so, within their own borders and countries. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as a UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of IDPs, I have placed an emphasis on the application of the UN Guiding Principles on Internal Displacements as an essential step in addressing overall migrant vulnerability. I wish to remind everyone that the 20th anniversary of these guiding principles will be commemorated in 2018. They are current, these guiding principles are currently being acknowledged by many states through their adoption of national IDP laws and policies, drafting of programs of action, and even inclusion to a certain extent in their own development agendas. More and more, the guiding principles are being used as normative frameworks for the protection of IDPs, even before they become, if needed, international migrants or asylum seekers. However, it's very obvious, ladies and gentlemen, that much, much more needs to be done. This is very um, clear when, when we look at the, the current IDP situation worldwide in terms of the intensity and the figures that have now reached crisis proportions. Many states continue to face challenges to protect the human rights of IDPs. I encourage everyone to use 2018 to mark not only gains but challenges in the implementation of the guiding principles on internal displacement and to ensure that we include IDPs and former IDPs in these assessments. In this way, IDPs' vulnerabilities can be effectively reduced and overcome and in my belief, that would be a very big contribution to reducing the overall vulnerability in the migrant context. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I'm very pleased to, to give the floor to Minister Mohamed of Ghana, and then uh, uh, we will continue with the uh, representative of the European Union and uh, uh, other uh, speakers. Please, uh, if you can be uh, short, given the very limited timeline, thank you very much in advance. Mr. Chairman, my colleague from Libya made a passionate appeal on African countries to identify stranded migrants in his country. 
Mr. Chairman, let me seize this opportunity to thank him and to add that this has not been brought to the attention of the government of Ghana. It is important to note that Ghana has evacuated its citizens from Libya on previous occasions. For instance, in 2011, during the Libyan crisis, approximately 18,500 uh, Ghanaians were in Libya. The government of Ghana and IOM successfully evacuated 12,034 Ghanaians. Let me add that one challenge confronting Ghana and other African countries in respect of this issue has to do with granting access to authorities of the countries concerned to the prisons and detention centers. Ghana is committed to identifying the Ghanaian migrants in Libya and even evacuating them as we have always done. Going forward, we would appreciate it if such information is given on a timely manner through the appropriate channel for requisite action to be taken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity once again. Chair, I'm speaking on behalf of the EU and its member states. We welcome the focus on migrants' vulnerabilities and appreciate the analysis and ways forward on vulnerabilities presented in this background paper. The EU recognizes the need to prioritize vulnerable groups in migration contexts, and thus the European Commission recently issued a communication on the protection of children in migration, which recognizes that more needs to be done to improve the protection of children. The EU undoubtedly re recognizes and fully supports the notion that all migrants, especially those who are vulnerable to violence, exploitation and abuse, are rights holders. We have an obligation under the international law to respect the human rights and fundamental freedoms, and we have a firm commitment to live up to uh, this obligation. We also underline the necessity to gather further data concerning the drivers of migra migrants' vulnerabilities in countries of origin, transit, and destination in order to better address the risks that migra migrants have to face during their often perilous journey. On this basis, we welcome the discussion on identifying potential gaps in the implementation of international law protecting migrants, including migrants in vulnerable situations. And we need to focus now on what could spe specifically be achieved also in the global combat on migration um, on this issue. Any vulnerability model would need to be based on and held within the framework of existing international laws and obligation. And therefore, we must focus on international cooperation to implement existing rules and regulation. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm pleased to give the floor to uh, the delegations of the Philippines. Um, this IDM is of particular importance to the ongoing consultation process leading to the adoption of the Global Compact on Migration. Promoting migrants' welfare and protection of their rights, including their basic human rights, is a major concern of my country, considering that 10% of our people are outside of the Philippines, working and residing abroad. For us, the starting point for the practical and doable solutions to migrants' vulnerabilities should be the recognition and entitlement of their human rights. Avoid, we should avoid the false dichotomy between practical and doable solutions and human rights-based approach. They are not mutually exclusive, as stated by, earlier by the G Swing. We also must avoid the tendency to consider that migrants in a regular situation having less rights than those in regular situations. This is, again, a false dichotomy, as both have the same set of rights. They are people. To uphold the false dichotomy is a surefire recipe for making migrants in a regular situation vulnerable to abuse and exploitation. We refer our colleagues to the, and participants of this IDM to the Global Migration Group's draft principles and practical guidelines on the protection of human rights of migrants in vulnerable situations. We wish them to take this into consideration as, uh, as the several UN agencies uh, output in finding solutions to migrants' vulnerabilities within human rights lens. We encourage participants to this IDM to define also vulnerabilities of migrants more comprehensively. It should not be limited to migrants' characteristics and categories, but also to their particular risk or situation that they are in. Please include in this definition the root causes of vulnerabilities, as stated by our SR on IP, IDPs. We also want to mention the Philippines and the U.S. Uh, 
initiative, the Migrants and Countries in Crisis Initiative, which was used in 2016, the MISEC guidelines to protect migrants in countries in crisis experience, experiencing conflict and natural disaster. This uh, guidelines is a toolkit for states in responding to the protection needs of migrants caught in countries in crisis. The guidelines offers many grounds, tested and doable, solution to migrants' vulnerabilities due to the situation they are in. Finally, just also to, to, to uh, point out that the Philippines has entered into many practical solutions, it's like the entering into bilateral labor agreements, and we would like to highlight in this point our bilateral agreement with, uh, with Germany as well as in Saudi Arabia. Uh, that it's a win for the workers, it's a win for the country of origin, and it's a win for the countries of destination. Um, let me end by uh, promoting the, uh, and highlighting the contribution of local governments. The local governments, in our, in our view, are the, in the front line, and they are the implementers of whatever we, we do and we agree at the multilateral level. Thank you very much. The OLC. The delegation of the OLC wishes to bring our attention to reality in which is, which is our overlooked in migration discussions, that is, the intimate relationship between a migrant and his or her family. Regrettably, too often, migrations bring about a double vulnerability, first for the migrant, but at the same time also for his or her family. In this regard, the Holy See wishes to reiterate that in shaping the global compact on migration, the family dimension needs to be taken into account, thus making migration a more positive experience for everybody. In fact, the family truly is foundation upon which a stable society, culture, and economic situation can flourish. And it's central in achieving sustainable development goals to establishing peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Deputy Director of the Division of International Protection from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Mr. Chair, Excellencies, migrants as well as refugees may find themselves in vulnerable situations for a wide range of reasons, which often overlap and which, broadly speaking, fall into two main categories. One is situational and can arise due to circumstances experienced en route or in countries of destination that put migrants at risk of exploitation, abuse, and hazardous conditions. The other relates to individual characteristics which may place a person at particular risk, for example, as a result of age, gender, or disability. These factors may interact to create a vulnerable situation where migrants require particular assistance to meet their needs. UNHCR is pleased in this regard to be contributing to the development of the Global Migration Group principles and guidelines on the human rights of migrants in vulnerable situations. Understanding migrant vulnerabilities can benefit from clarity about the differences between, on one hand, the specific needs which migrants or other people on the move may have because they're in a vulnerable situation as just, as just described, and on the other hand, the need for international protection which arises when a person is outside their own country and is unable to return home because of a serious threat to their life, physical integrity, or freedom there. So in effect, the reasons for which they have left. A central feature of international protection is protection from refoulement and is flagged with its strong existing legal framework. This is a particularly important element for us to flag so as to ensure that any efforts to effectively meet the specific needs, to not, uh, specific needs of migrants in vulnerable situations do not duplicate or undermine existing legal frameworks. In this context, for example, as a result of incomplete or inconsistent application of the 1951 Convention and other relevant frameworks, implementation gaps have arisen. Where this is so, the most pressing need from our perspective is to work towards fuller and more robust implementation of the agreed international framework for international protection. Mr. Chair, while refugees and others who are forcibly displaced across borders and who cannot return home are distinct in their need for international protection, both refugees and migrants face common challenges due to, their, due to their individual circumstances or their circumstances in which they are traveling 
which may place them at risk. It is essential that we protect their human rights and put in place mechanisms to meet their individual needs, including to ensure their protection and humane treatment at all points along the routes of movement. We look forward to engaging together with states, SRSG Arbour, and members of the Global Migration Group, including IOM in particular, to contribute to the development of principles on the treatment of migrants in vulnerable situations, drawing on our extensive experience in areas such as protection, reception and assistance, and responding to mixed migration. Let me conclude, please, by drawing your attention, please, to two recently published papers which are available online in our repository RefWorld. The two papers entitled Migrants in Vulnerable Situation, UNHCR's Perspectives, and the second paper, Persons in Need of International Protection, which elaborate further on some of the points which I have raised this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Australia. Thank you for this fantastic discussion. We support the work to better understand migrants in a vulnerable situation and I also warmly welcome the DG's clarification this morning about the terminology to ensure that there is consistency with the agreed language in the New York Declaration. The issues to hand are not due to the absence of existing frameworks but due to their patchy implementation. I think this was a theme that came out on the panel. Um, the existing international legal and normative frameworks provide appropriate rights and protections for all individuals, including migrants. Therefore, we think we need to focus on guidance on how to do, on how best to apply existing frameworks in particular circumstances, and we need to support states to do so. Noting earlier IOM's important um, comment about the operational challenges. I think there's probably three areas we'd like to draw attention to in the limited time. The first involves strengthening national governments national governance systems. This is an area where we encourage all countries to continue their efforts to develop and strengthen the way they manage their migration frameworks. Uh, the second is to strengthen regional mechanisms. Um, we're involved in the Bali process with our neighbours, which faci facilitates dialogue and cooperation, importantly helping to tackle and address the problems that migrants in vulnerable situations face. Another important area, I think, where states can work together and with other actors is in strengthening the collection, analysis and sharing of information and data. This is incredibly important and we warmly welcome the sort of work that we hear IOM was doing and from the panel presentation earlier this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Afghanistan, please. Afghanistan would like to acknowledge the dialogue and glad to see the comprehensive view on the concepts, drivers and protection challenges. Let me quote the report, uh, the report on International Displacement Monitoring Center of 2017, which was recently released, and it says, quote, more than half of those who entered Europe via Greece in the first three months of 2016 said they had initially be been displaced internally and another quarter were first or second generation of refugees who never left in their country, unquote. This this quotation was specifically from the report chapter on Afghanistan. The report indicates recurrent move in various forms, including crossing the border, highlighting the need to address drivers of move in a sustainable and comprehensive way. As a sovereign nation and country, we take the matter of IDPs very seriously, and it's a matter of priority and action for the government. However, the magnitude, drivers, including the unprecedented, unprecedented return from neighboring countries, and the risk factors for recurrent move present a complex situation for which an international engagement and support is required. And we would like this topic to be part of the discussion in the future months until we develop the compact on migrations. Thank you very much. Uh, delegation of Mexico. Para México la condición de vulnerabilidad en el fenómeno migratorio es muy significativa debido eh, a su relación directa con el diseño e instrumentación de servicios de protección y atención a las necesidades de los migrantes. Eh, el Pacto Mundial de Migración, por tanto, será trascendente, pensamos, en tanto logre contribuir a la atención de las necesidades de protección en el terreno por lo que México favorece la utilización de herramientas ya existentes en materia de, de, materia de derechos humanos y buenas prácticas. Eh, favorecemos una visión de largo aliento y eh, que incluya desde luego un enfoque práctico. Eh, 
déjeme citar dos ejemplos. En el caso de nuestra experiencia eh, en la práctica consular mexicana, eh, a través de nuestros 50 consulados en los Estados Unidos y algunos en Canadá, hemos eh, desarrollado mecanismos y herramientas y programas que han probado ser efectivos para la atención de migrantes, especialmente los vulnerables. Y en nuestra frontera sur tenemos eh, varios protocolos eh, operando, uno de ellos eh, que atiende específicamente a, a los niños y niñas y adolescentes migrantes no acompañados o separados con una atención integral. Finalmente, si el tiempo lo permitiera, eh, nos gustaría conocer la opinión de los integrantes del panel sobre, la perspectiva, sobre una perspectiva integral de, de protección respecto de conceptos específicos de vulnerabilidad o en situación vulnerable. Muchas gracias de nuevo. The floor is now given to Ethiopia. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I, I thank also the IOM for organizing this important gathering. Mr. Moderator, the need for having a clear definition of vulnerable migrants and migrants in vulnerable situations is important. Ethiopia believes that we do not need a definition of vulnerability that is limited to some or certain individual vulnerability groupings. Migrants crossing dangerous routes or undocumented migrants often face situational vulnerability that involves all. Vulnerability should therefore take into account individual and situational perspectives that render migrants unable to defend their rights or seek redress when a violation occurs. Hence, though this person does not belong the traditional social groups, groupings, such as the disabled children, women, it is important that we ensure that absence of definitional clarity do not prevent these people from protection. With regard to adequacy of the existing system, we believe, Mr. Moderator, that there are a range of international instruments that can provide a good ground for, for the protection of migrants in vulnerable situations and vulnerable migrants as well. The problem, by and large, lies in the implementation of these instruments. Ethiopia believes that the guidelines envisaged under the New York Declaration would go a long way to fill the gaps in protection in relation to migrants in vulnerable situations. In this regard, the MIKIC and GMG guidelines and principles and the Nansen initiative provide a good ground to further develop the guidelines. I'm giving the floor now to Denmark. Denmark refers to the statement made on behalf of the EU and its member states. When it comes to understanding migrant vulnerability, we would like to use this occasion to emphasize that we already have the necessary human rights norms and obligations at hand. What we need is effective implementation of existing rules and standards, and we are very happy, very happy to see this reflected in the panel. Any guidelines on how to address migrant vulnerability must therefore be based on and held within the framework of existing international law and obligations. Moreover, it is absolutely fundamental that we maintain a clear distinction between migrants and refugees in order not to put our international regime for the protection of refugees at risk. It is imperative that we focus on addressing the underlying causes of migrant vulnerability through a targeted and coordinated humanitarian approach. Furthermore, we must agree that return of irregular migrants in vulnerable situations to their countries of origins in safety and dignity remains the solution for those who do not have legal stay. We would like to reiterate, reiterate our strong conviction that managing irregular migration and fulfilling human rights obligations are not mutually exclusive. Rather, they go together. I thank you.